welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. First of all, uh, it's one of the perks of uh, being online that you can travel virtually everywhere. I kind of wish of, of <laughs> to be with you uh, in person, but that's the deal and we have to, to adapt. So uh, why today and why gRPC, first of all? Well, uh, during my work as an architect, I work with a, lo a lot of teams and I noticed that a lot of them are using REST. And REST seems to be like uh, the de facto standard for whenever they choose to and they need to implement an API. So I think the teams and us as developers, we need to know about every technology out there in order to make an informed decision when there is the case. Okay, so today I'm going to try and convince you to embrace gRPC if you are a .NET developer. So first of all, who am I? I'm from Romania, from a city called Yash. I'm an organizer of a user group. I teach .NET and from time to time I blog. Not as often as I want, but check it out. Maybe there are useful information out there. And in my daily life, I am a software architect. So we cannot talk about... APIs and distributed systems without um, remembering <laughs> the time. Uh, I remember when I first started 12, year, uh, 12 years ago, um, I worked with monoliths. I had huge solutions with a lot of projects, and it was an easy life for me. Uh, why? Well, it, it's very easy. Uh, with the monolith, you have a single code, code base for everything. And well, Having a single code base for everything, it means that every dependency you will ever need, it's there. You're going to go to dependency injection container, or you're simply just going to instantiate the class. But if you need something from the code, it's there in your code. You can go and grab it, right? But the monolith has a few issues. Uh, me as a junior, of course, I didn't know about those issues because I was too young to know. But a monolith is some, somehow hard to scale. Not impossible, but hard. And scaling a monolith is way expensive. Think about a, 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 a huge system that has a lot of smaller subcomponents. And from those subcomponents, some of them are not used or are used very, very uh, little in the entire business process. If we were to scale the monolith, we would need to scale even those components that are not used. And that would cost us money, us who are the business money. Uh, and of course, uh, the server is very loaded. And also when it comes to deploys, you have all or nothing, you either work or it doesn't. So remembering the time back in the history, we, of, I, for example, I work with ASP web forms at that moment. And everything was there. It has like front end and back end in a single uh, single unit. And then MVC appeared and it was pretty much the same thing, front end and back end with one or several databases. But now uh, pretty much every business out there tries to separate these two entities. Now we have front end apps written in whatever JS and a back end written maybe in .NET or Java or whatever other technology. But we have two entities, and these two entities need to communicate. We do not have one-to-one -one correspondence. We might have micro frontends, which are uh, several smaller um, UI apps that are built in together, and we have several backends and several databases. And this was a time, but now the future is distributed. Now we might have something like this, a front end that communicates with several backends, or that backends might communicate with third parties or several other backends that have an, their turn databases. And given that we have such an architecture and we all want to work on modern architecture like microservices, and we all strive to, to have microservices because of its benefit, now, because we have so small, uh, so small units, now we can have an infrastructure like this. Now we can have every other language out there, any other tool out there. We might have a .NET app that communicates with a Go, Go application. 
or a .NET Core that consumes Node.js. And Node.js talks with a third-party API. And anything you can imagine, it can be possible in a specific scenario of any business. So given the fact that everything is somehow API-based, most of the team teams say, hey, now we have REST for everything. Why do we need any other technology? REST, you do an API, you say that it's REST, and well, that API is callable from anywhere you need, server, client, or any other app. But think about this. Now we have a client and a server, and each time this client communicates with the server, there is a process that is called content negotiation that we do not kind of care about, but is there and it's happening. And if you come from a .NET world, that content, content negotiation is there by default in Web API. What means this? So the content negotiation process uh, takes care of the format of the request. It cares about things like, what is the payload that I need to answer with if I am the server or if I am the client? I might care about the, the format of the re response that I'm getting. Will I be able to understand that, that response? Uh, or maybe I, I care of, about things like, hey, how do I uh, ask from the server a specific format for the response? How do I handle this? And how do I handle things on, on the UI side if the server isn't able to respond with, with what I need? But what do I do if I need to do with to deal with error handling? How do I handle errors? or if I have transient errors, how many times do I retry? Or how do I handle those retries? Um, authentication, okay, how do I do that? And if I'm the client or the consumer of a specific API, what happens when the model changes? I mean, if me as a client, I'm expecting a specific model from the server in the response, and that model is not there anymore. How do I treat this? Or as a server, if my model changes, how do I notify the client that, hey, my model changed? And if my model changed, how do I force all my consumers to upgrade to the newer version? So whew, there is a lot of work around that. And we need to care as developers how to handle everything. And now you might say, OK, this is happening. We need to take care of smaller details. But in definitive, why, why, what is wrong with REST? I mean, it, it does a job. It's been there. We all strive to do RESTful APIs, right? Um, and I'm going to say, well, REST as a concept is very good. Um, and I also have a talk about REST. But REST does one thing. It forces you to have evolvable APIs as long as you implement it correctly. But if not, it, it's counterintuitive because if the model changes, it forces you to have a certain conversation in your team like, hey, I need another property. Hey, this property is not there anymore. Hey, I need to notify the client that everything uh, in the model changed. I need to force my clients to upgrade to the newer version and so on and so forth. And uh, this conversation is, is just fine if you're lucky enough to have both the client and, and the API in your team or in your company. But what happens if, well, you do not own the client app and your team doesn't develop the front end, you don't have front end developers, then how do you handle things when you do not know when, what are the consumers and who are your consumers who consumes your API? Think about, I don't know, let's say GitHub. There are so many tools that integrate with GitHub and there are wrappers over the GitHub commands and so on. GitHub might not know who are these integrators. And if you are an API owner and you put your API outside in the world, you need to care about your API consumers. And this kind of conversations cannot take, take place. So you cannot go to a specific team and say, hey, team, front-end developers, I need a specific field in the API because the business changed or 
I need to be backwards compatible or forward compatible. And well, this is where RPC comes into play or remote procedure calls. So RPC as a, as a concept is not new. It's been there, I think, from the 60s or 70s or something like that. <clears throat> RPC, or a remote procedure call, will make the system feel like, uh, even if, if it's distributed, it's in the same place. And RPC, let's look at the code. Oh, we will have a few variables. First, first one is called order, which calls... Um, or whatever sales bounded context to create an order and pass that order request. Next, we're gonna process the payment for that order. And then if the payment status is successful, we need to arrange for, for shipping, okay? If we look at this, it is like, well, the code belongs to the same monolith maybe, or there are uh, services somehow integrated, but it, it kind of belongs in the same app, right? And belonging to the same app, it will allow you as a developer to call that code. But what if we go further and I'm gonna tell you that, hey, the payment processing part of it involves a network call. And every time you call that method, that method is basically a wrapper over something that does a network call. And abusing this method, because it's so nice and clean and programmatic, uh, will actually maybe cause uh, an issue of performance in your app, because you forget that is network involved. But for you as a developer, it gives you a nice experience. The code is like in the same context. So RPC as a whole will make the code look local, and it's prone to errors just because developers tend to forget that network. And the main goal of it as a concept is to make network communication transparent. So pretty much saying that, hey, what if you have a distributed system, no matter how big, that behaves like monolith? Your life as developer would be very easy. You wouldn't care about, I don't know, Kubernetes, orchestration, uh, microservices that are flying around and moving pieces inside your distributed system. Uh, everything behaves like a big monolith and is there and it's easy for you to, to use it. That's the main purpose. And you say, okay, RPC, but what's the deal with gRPC? Well, gRPC is nothing else than um, a beautiful implementation of that, that concept. Uh, as a short history, it appeared in 2001 as being Google Stubby, an internal project. A few years later, uh, gRPC uh, has been open source and it received a new name. And way later, 11 years later, gRPC had its version one. And starting two years ago, September, gRPC is the first class citizen in .NET Core. Uh, it was around for a long time a long time, 2016, but not for .NET developers. And we know that with .NET Core, a lot of things have improved for us. And gRPC, as a concept, it's an implementation of that specific old concept, making everything look local. But it's contract-based, uh, and being contract-based, it means that you will specify what your service will implement, and you're going to distribute the contract. It's like going to the bank and uh, getting a loan and say, okay, I'm going to pay you uh, monthly, by monthly debt, okay? Uh, another cool thing about it is that there are no code references. And usually people, when they work with microservices and they tend to have a microservice architecture, they sometimes wrap a lot of HTTP clients because, um, let's say, the first step when you have a service to service calls, because microservices should be independent, but that independence is somehow relative because you need to bring data over from different other microservices that are independent. And one way of doing that is to do HTTP clients. And with HTTP clients, I've seen teams that are 
creating nugget packages, distributed distributing those no, nugget packages with HTTP clients because they hard code that, they add logic for the clients, and, and they simply distribute that uh, those packages to whenever microservices will ever need a specific other. So add the reference, nugget package, you will have there an HTTP client that knows how to call and what service to call and so on, and life is easy. But there is a problem with that. Um, they tend to grow and they tend to beget, uh, to begin to become spaghetti code uh, because they won't have only the logic for HTTP client. They will have business logic soon and any other types of, of code uh, there, not only the HTTP clients. So, so they tend to grow. And if they tend to grow, they will attract additional logic that shouldn't be distributed in Nugget packages. So when we're talking about no code reference, uh, we're saying exactly that. We will have no Nugget packages around gRPC. Another cool thing about gRPC is that inherently, by default, it uses HTTP2, which is a new implementation of HTTP that is way faster. And being way faster means that we can serve more requests uh, faster. Another thing is that it has a different serialization uh, that is called protobuf. And protobuf is there for a long while, which in turn gives us a smaller payload. And if you combine the two, you will see that you'll have a flying gap. You have smaller payload because of the serialization, and it's way faster because it's HTTP2. So 2.1 here. And another thing is that it's available in many, many, many languages. Think about the language, and you can use gRPC. And another thing is that it has code generation for you. So you just need to use it, and it will write some code for you. gRPC, how it looked like. If we're, we were to compare this with client server request response that we know from classical HTTP, now we have something in between. Now we will have a dot proto file with a specific syntax that will sit in between. And this will be the contract between the two. And without this proto file, the two parties won't be able to, to chat and understand each other. So proto file, what is this? This proto file is a, a file with the proto extension that has a specific writing in it. For example, in here, we're going to say that the syntax for the proto file is proto3, the version of proto. Uh, you're going you're gonna to say that, OK, this is the namespace for my project. And then the package that is generated is called Fibonacci. And then what you're going to do is to go there and actually specify how your service will look like. And this is the contract that you're going to expose to different microservices. So you're going to say that, hey, I have, I hope this is visible. I'm drawing, drawing something with red. So you're going to use a keyword service. You're going to give it a name. And inside it, you're going to say, hey, this is an RPC method uh, that is called Compute Fibonacci that has an input of that type and returns uh, this type. So if we were to compare, this is the in, is like the request, and this is the out, like the response in, in the traditional way. And the, the two types of messages are simply um, written with the message keyword, you give it a name, and then you're going to add something like the properties. And these properties, don't be fooled, uh, one, and number equals one, it's not an assignment. It's actually being the binary uh, serialization. It's actually the order in that binary binary string. And also with the special syntax called proto, um, you will have some specific types that you'll have to look. That And these types are going to be transformed into the types that we know and we are familiar in, in C Sharp. The same for, for uh, the second one. We have Fibonacci result. Uh, it's a field called result, and it's the first one in line. So this is how it looks like. But 
this is not all the power of uh, of gRPC. I'm going to show you um, a few things in demos. The power of gRPC relies on uh, the gRPC types, or some people call them modes or method types. It's up to you how you use this term. It basically refers to the same thing. First method is called unary. It's the traditional uh, way of uh, implementing a request response. Uh, the second one is server streaming, which means that the server is pushing several pieces of, of data towards the client. And client streaming is the other way around. The client sends a lot of uh, pieces to the server that is listening. And of course, the fourth uh, method or mode, it's called bidirectional in which on the same connection, uh, the server and the client can communicate with several pieces of data in an asynchronous way, maybe. So this being the four, the four types, we're gonna take them one by one. Unary, as I already mentioned, there is the traditional way. There is an entity called client, being it its, a, its server or browser, initiates a request, the server uh, receives the request, processes the request, and responds with the uh, the request, the response for that specific request. How this would look like, it's exactly like in the for example, to define a specific method that is unary, you will specify which is the in type and which is the out type. This should be there. So one in, one out. You can look at it uh, at this, mo this mode. Server streaming. Server streaming means that once the client initiates a request with one thing, so sends something in, the client, the server can answer with several pieces of data. Bear in mind, this communication uh, in gRPC, it cannot happen like it happens in SignalR. Uh, you just push things to the clients. In gRPC, the client needs to be the one that initiates the request. So it pings the server, hey, I'm here. And then the server sends something back to it, OK? So it cannot be like a push mechanism from the server to the client without the client ever wanting to initiate the communication with the server. Client streaming, it's OK. The client sends several things in, and it receives only one thing out. Uh, if this would be just, just fine for, I don't know, collecting data, maybe, or when you need to upload things in smaller chunks, like, um, I don't know, a movie, uh, several photos, music, or whatever blob thing, you can use this to, to stream to the server piece by piece. Or maybe, I don't know, upload data for, from different sensors might be a, a good scenario. And the fourth one, is bidirectional streaming, where, well, someone needs to initiate the communication. You have uh, the client that sends several things in, and the server that responds with several things. So several in, sev several out. Uh, this communication doesn't necessarily is uh, synchronous. Like you send one, two, three, and you receive back one, two, three. It can be asynch asynchronous. It's up to you how you implement this. <clears throat> Okay, uh, cool things, cool things, but how do you define these kind of things? So first of all, I'm gonna show you uh, Visual Studio, but first of all, I'm gonna want you to look at these stream keywords. Whenever you see a stream keyword, it means that this party, it sends a stream of. So in this part, Compute Fibonacci uh, receives a stream of, requested number, so a stream of ints, several things. And it also responds with a stream of a Fibonacci result, which means that you, uh, you're going to send several things out. So this is how it works, pretty much. OK, uh, enough with the theory. Uh, let's have a look at some code. So I'm going to go to Visual Studio. And first of all, I'm going to go and open a new instance because this instance, I'm going to show you pretty much how you will find and how you will implement such a gRPC project. So what you'll do is create a new project. 
And disclaimer, it's my first time using what I'm using and I'm, uh, I hope my computer not to crash and I also pray in my mind. And we're going to wait a bit. So once you go to this project, uh, you're going to see down below a type of service that is simply called gRPC. And it's called ASP.NET Core gRPC service. You're going to click next. And at the next screen, you're going to be prompted uh, for a name. It, it's just fine like this. And in the next screen, you're going to be asked if you have several um, SDKs like .NET 3.1 and so on to select what is the option. And as you see, this is notifying you that this is LTS and current and out of support. I'm going to go with .NET Core 3.1. And I'm going to hit Create. And what you'll see, because .NET Core is pretty much a console app, you'll see something that is very familiar uh, to you from MVC or Web API. Uh, you're going to see a pseudo classes that are somehow there for you to use. Uh, this is the, the default template. You're going to see the app settings, uh, the program CS, and the startup CS with a few tweaks. And I'm going to try to zoom it here. If this one won't crash, hopefully. Come on. Okay. So, a startup program, app settings, JSON. These are super familiar to you, but you'll see that there is no controller folder, but you'll have protos folder and services. Okay. And we're going to have a look uh, at those independently. First of all, in startup, uh, you're going to see that. GRPC is added there by default as a middleware. Come on, Visual Studio. Don't be shy. OK. Um, what do we have here? The middleware that is out there for you to use already at GRPC. Um, and the rest is somehow familiar. You have use endpoints, you have routing, and, and so on. I need to build this, but I'm not going to build the project just because I get the feeling that Visual Studio will crash. Host Builder, the same is very is familiar. And we're going to have a look at dependencies. At packages, you'll see that is gRPC SP net core and a specific version. Pretty much this is all, um, these are all the packages. Um, but you're going to see here. In the proto file, that is, is the default one. I'm going to try to maximize this and make some room. OK. So you have the syntax, the namespace, the package that will be generated. And you have here uh, a method that is unary. It's unary because we're not seeing the stream keyword anywhere. And the hello request type defined here, and hello reply type defined here. So it's pretty much the, the example that I showed you. OK, now I'm going to say, OK, so what? You have a proto file. OK, but this proto file is just a contract that you can distribute between your services, uh, microservices. Uh, the big bl building block is the actual service. And the actual service is the implementation um, of that interface definition language. Think about the proto file as being an interface in C Sharp. You, the interface is the contract that tells you what, what to have. And the service, it will be the actual implementation of it. So uh, the service is something that will uh, be inherited from Gritter, Gritter base, because these are the names that we specified in the proto file. So Gritter, ba Gritter, Gritter base, this is not code that I've written. It's there and generated. And if we were to look here, grid, you see the service is called Gritter. And in here, I ate this. It's Gritter. And the Gritter base is, is something that is generated for us. And if I'm going to F12 there, you're going to see some weird looking code, uh, something that is there generated. So it's public abstract partial class Gritter base. That is basically something that looks like uh, our method. Okay, 
it's our method, it's our input type, and we have the server call context that will be there. And we're going to talk about that. Okay, so code that we didn't wrote, but is there for us to use, okay? And once you inherit from here, the rest is, is history. It's a simple service. Um, and that simple service will allow you to simply use things like loggers, repositories, or any other things that you want and need in the constructor is there, it's is classical way of writing code. And uh, you also need to give an implementation of what you specified in the proto file. And that implementation might look like, like this. You have the hello request, which is the type that we, uh, we specified in the proto file as the input. Uh, and you're gonna do that something with the input. In here, it, is the, it returns hello and the request name, okay? What you're gonna see in every other type of method is this server call context. And this several, this additional parameter will allow you to interact with the current request. It's similar to with um, what you already know, like HTTP request, where you have a request and response and you can tweak them there and extract things from there. It's exactly that. So you cannot get rid of it because it's the context of the specific call. And this is this is it. You have a full-fledged gRPC service. But now I'm gonna close this. And I'm go, gonna show you uh, an app that it has several uh, several projects. And first of all, I want you to to be familiar with what what I have here. I have is a server that has a profile and that has implementation for the specific proto file. And then I have nothing more, nothing else than four console apps. I have the unary type because I want to show you this. I have the server streaming, client streaming, and the bidirectional one, okay? And I'm gonna go and show you the, the server, the server app. Uh, program CS, nothing else, nothing more, but I'm gonna show you the proto file. And the proto file, I'm gonna also increase the font size here. In our case, the proto file has all the four, four, uh, four methods like defined. Okay, I have these four types of, of methods. I'm gonna also give an implementation for you for them because these are here. So Unity one, it doesn't have the stream keyword. We have the server stream, which means we have one thing in, one type in, that returns a stream of type. Client stream has a stream of things in as an input and returns one thing. And the bidirectional, it has a stream of things in and a stream of things out. So this is all the fuzz. This is how you differentiate between them. What we have is hello request, hello reply. Uh, it's a message and here it's a name for the types, okay? And we're gonna take them one by one. So in the greater service, oh, a cool thing that I want to show you and I want not to forget. So um, I'm gonna expand this and I'm gonna show you the dependencies in the packages. And you'll see, this is the previous, I didn't want to, to upgrade this, but you have gRPC core. And one thing, if we were to edit the project file that I want to show you, is something that is called an item group. This can be added by hand, but I'm gonna show you in the a little bit later. So what it says, I have an item group of this type, protobuf, that includes the path of the proto file, which is, where is it, where is it, which is here in this specific project. It can also be elsewhere. It's up to you from where you get that proto file, but it needs to be there and the project needs to have access to it. And another thing that uh, you need to see is that gRPC services here has a value of server. So this is one way of specifying that, hey, this project, it acts like a server for a gRPC project, okay? So this is everything with the server. Cool. Uh, so getting back to the gRPC service, I'm gonna briefly expand the <coughs> say hello 
because you already saw this. So it receives one thing in, is the second parameter with the context that we do not care about right now. And it uh, returns a task of hello reply. So I'm gonna read from the request the name and I'm gonna just hello it, okay? So now I'm gonna have the, on the left-hand side, I'm gonna clear the screen just to make it uh, neat. This is the, the server application that I'm gonna run. Uh, hopefully that will be there. So what it needs to happen is the server needs to be up, okay? So because it doesn't solve the, the problem of the system being up. Fingers crossed. Okay, so it built and you'll see that uh, it's listening to a specific path, okay? 5,001 for HTTP and 5,000 for, for this. Okay, so now the server is up, we're gonna go to the right-hand side and in here, place the console app that uh, will call things from the server. And you'll see what's ha if this builds, you'll see what's happening, okay? So what's happened is that the client send something, sent a string with a uh, ktox, and it receives a response, hello, ktox, okay? What happened in the server side? Well, in the server side, uh, you see something that a request has finished on this protocol, HTTP2, and it's, it is of type post because every gRPC request, no matter what of the fourth methods you are using, it's a post request. So it's not a get, not a put, not, not nothing. It's post and that's it. And then you're gonna see that uh, it listens to localhost, specific port, and then it's uh, a service and it's say hello. So it's a method call that you are seeing there. It's not an endpoint, it's a method call. It looks like a method call. And also you'll see a MIME type called application gRPC because this is the MIME type that goes back and forth. And also a status code, a familiar status code, 200 is 200 okay. It will be there because it's HTTP. And then uh, some info about how long it took uh, the request, okay? So request reply, easy, one in, one out. Another thing, let's have a look at the actual code from the client because we didn't uh, look at it. So first of all, I need to start by zooming in to the packages. It's a console app, simple, nothing, nothing fancy about it. But I added a few things like Google Protobuf, gRPC and gRPC tools, gRPC tools in needed because uh, we want to, to read the generated code, okay? And these are the packages that I'm using. And I want to, to show you one thing, uh, frameworks, analyzing, analyzers, and that's it. We have pretty much no project dependencies. I do not have a reference to the server uh, project like we, we used to do before with Nugget packages, either by managing Nugget packages or adding project reference. No, this project is totally independent. And now you say, okay, oh, so if it's independent on its own, how does it know how and what to call? Well, you need to edit the project file and you need to look for an item group that is similar to what I showed you in the server app. Uh, but here we have the client, not the server as it was specified. And in the include part, we have the, the path to the proto uh, file. And that proto file is actually the file that comes from here. And also, of course, you can um, add it to a upper location, but as long as uh, every other app has access to it, it can live outside of the project or outside of uh, the solution or whatever. But the, the apps need to, be, to have access to it. Okay, so this is pretty much all the fuss. Go there, navigate to the proto file, find it and add it in the path here. Okay. So how is everything happening? You'll say, okay, um, 
understood. I have a project. I have a few nugget packages. I have in uh, in the CS profile the path to the proto file that I'm interested in, the definition, and then how do I handle things? So the things are handled in the same manner you are handling HTTP clients. You need to to specify where to call, and that where to call is made through something that is called a channel. So gRPC doesn't have the concept of uh, a connection or something like that. It's called channel. For example, if, if you work with Rabbit or something similar, you might have seen the concept of a, of a channel there also. So you need to instantiate the channel <coughs> and you have the option of specifying things like credential or, or not. Uh, this is would be the, the, the authentication, the credential for the channel itself, for the quote unquote uh, connection. But down below, uh, you will need to instantiate the client and pass that channel uh, in. So that client is nothing that the greeter, you remember that we use the greeter as package, as the service name before? Well, you have something that is called greeter client in our case, there for you to use. Uh, I didn't wrote that, it's there for me. Uh, so it's called greeter client. It's there. So it's like some magic happens behind the scene. Uh, also, you'll have uh, the option of uh, passing things, um, options for the channel, but I'm going to show you later. And what you do with the, ch the channel is simply uh, call the methods that are available there. Uh, you need to instantiate the request to give it a name. I'm writing in the console for us to, uh, to see what's happening. And then you're going to say, hey, this is the client. From the client, call the methods. And you'll see here, that the methods that we implemented with the specific names are there. Oh, come on. I to zoom in. I'm fine. So we have server stream, say hello, blah, blah, blah. Everything is there. Okay. So if it's there, we can use it. So we pass the request. And with the request, we can pass options. And those options are related to, okay, uh, how how after how long you can abort the this you know and don't receive any response and something things like that so call options is there for you to to tweak the way you handle the response from from the method call and we simply respond and that's all the fuss so create a channel create a client create a request because you create a request and then you need to listen for the reply and Call the method that you prefer. Okay, this is with the unary part. Uh, I'm going to close this. And the next one on our list, it's let's say look in the server. So say hello is done. Let's have a look at the server stream method, how it looks and what it does. So uh, the server stream is called server stream because I thought it's easier to understand. The server stream has uh, one thing in. So one input of this type, uh, and having one input of that type, it will also have the server call context. We cannot get rid of, the, uh, of that. And also, it has something uh, that is called an iServer stream writer of T, of hello reply in our case. So this uh, identifies the fact that it will reply with a stream of that type, OK? So what it will do. It's, well, um, looping in to this zero, to this number, and writing uh, a reply. And what we're going to do is just uh, write in the stream async. OK, to this trailer part, I'm going to go uh, a little bit later. So what we expect here is the server to listen. And uh, what is this server stream? And on the right hand side, the same. We're going to build the app. Uh, unary, not unary, dot net run should do the job. Now, what we should see is several things coming from the server. And you'll see that on the right hand side, things are moving. So the server is still writing responses to the client. And we wait and we wait. Okay. 
what happened? The server received one thing, and you see you have the server stream method that is called here to handle it okay as an application, um, how long it took. But in, th in this side, you see several things sent from the server to the client. Okay, and this is how it works. Okay, now you have here uh, a message that is called found some trailer values gRPC header. Well, in this part, um, we do not have a way of working with headers uh, in the traditional way, like we have accept, blah, 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 in the response in HTTP. But here we have a way of mimicking those, he those headers by adding trailers, uh, which are nothing else, nothing more than dictionaries. You have a key and you have a value for that key. And this is specifically uh, related to the call, and that's it. For example, and you simply add it to that call, and uh, the client will be able to read them. Okay. It says, hey, find some trailer values, and the value is gRPC header, which is exactly this. You can use the trailers for adding things like um, authentication or Maybe you want to count uh, how many times the method was called. I don't know. It might be a scenario. Uh, you can add authorization things like bearer tokens and whatnot. You can mimic, poor call, everything. Okay? But do not confuse this type of authorization-related things with what is um, at the channel level. Because we heal, in here, we use the insecure channel. We also have an option of adding TLS or something that, uh, like that in here, policies related to authorization or authentication. But that is an upper level. Okay. Uh, looking at the server streaming, it behaves pretty much the same. It's a client app, uh, which we do like opening a client, uh, uh, instantiating a client, and then uh, do a few things with it, like. Uh, calling the server stream with one request. Remember, you need to, to say something to the server before the server says a lot of things to you. Also, you can also uh, pass cancellation tokens if needed. And in response, you're going to just await for your type of reply and read from the response stream. Uh, it's somehow strangely looking, but you're basically doing that. You look at the response stream and read from there as long as you have something to read. Okay, how do you uh, read things from the trailers? It's easy. You just get the call and you call get trailers to obtain that dictionary of, of uh, your pairs. Okay, and one thing uh, you'll see related to our gRPC is the exception type. And the exception type is of type RPC exception, specifically to this. And you're also going to have some status codes, but the status codes are different uh, of no from HTTP. So you'll have like ported, already exists, canceled data loss, not found okay, out of range, permission denied, unauthenticated, and a few things more. But this somehow has have nothing to do with what you know in HTTP. These are RPC related, okay? And you'll be able to um, to treat this simply uh, by filtering, right? Because this is what we do here. And what I want to show is just another thing. Like, you can pass something that is called a, a deadline to uh, your calls. And you can say something like, hey, if I do not receive a response from the server in, I don't know, five seconds, then abort this. And you will be able to uh, uh, catch the deadline exceed or maybe write the message. And what I'm going to do in here, I'm going to run this again. You'll see that we get the exception that the deadline is exceeded. Uh, where do I <laughs> modify? I didn't build that. Uh, no, nope. save first of all. 
first rule of coding, save if you want to see some changes. But another run, build in progress. Now we're seeing greeting timeout because we wanted, hey, wait one millisecond. If you do not gather an answer from this uh, error out, uh, throw an exception. Okay, and this is what happened because one millisecond was exceeded, of course. Okay, this is the server streaming. Let's have a look at the client one. Uh, and I'm gonna start with the server and I'm gonna look at the third message, method type. Okay, client stream. Now, the client stream has uh, several things in, several requests or pieces of a request, several call contexts that is there and we cannot get rid of it. And it responds with one thing, a hello reply. And as a, as a big logic that we have here is just to, to write uh, a base message. And what we do is while uh, there is something in the request stream, read it from the request stream, and then read the current payload from the request stream, and then compose a message with that specific payload. And the reply in the end is just that payload message um, with the name. So as long as we have something, read it, and then answer, hey, this is the last thing that I got from you. Okay, uh, this is one. And, and the client streaming is pretty much the same concept applied. Channel, client, cancellation token source if needed, but uh, you simply just use and call the client stream. And what it has here is from zero to that specific number, it's going to write a bunch of requests or pieces of requests. And what we're going to do is, hey, just wait uh, to complete. So as long as we do not have things in, we consider it complete and just going to wait for this. OK. Server is open, up and running, listens to us. And in the client streaming part, I'm going to run this. And you'll see in the left-hand side that the server receives a lot of faces, a lot of eyes. And you'll see that is moving up to that uh, number. I hope it's not too high. I hope I didn't add a million or something like that. But we're going to have a look here. And in turn, the right-hand side, which is a client, it will receive back the last I that is sent. You see, okay, I'm still receiving things. Receiving, 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 I'm waiting. And after I'm done with the waiting, I'm gonna say, hey, this is the last thing that I received. So this would be like uploading something. It's still uploading. And you'll see here that finally, uh, it, it writes back the last I, starting from zero to uh, 1,000. 100,000 or something like that. And we got this, which is perfectly fine. So several to the server, one thing's out. And of course, the last part uh, is the bidirectional one. So it's from the server, bidirectional. And you'll see in terms of uh, parameters is that several things in is async stream reader and AI server stream writer in, in response, and the third one that we do not care about right now. So what it does is several in, several out. So you have here, hello reply, you have a base message, and as long as we have something to, to read from the request stream, we're going to write it async. So it's like, like a loop writing there. I'm getting something, I'm writing something, getting something, writing something. OK, and bear in mind that these can be made uh, very async, so do not rely on th those. So this is the implementation. And when it comes to the actual client, uh, you'll see some strange, strange looking code. Create a channel, create a client. And then what you'll see here is in a using statement, you'll see the client bidirectional. The, that's the method that I want to, to call. And what we do here is open a task. And while we have things from this a response stream, access the current stream is like accessing HTTP context current and write what you receive here. And then 
the request part is like from zero to 10, writing something to the request stream. So I'm waiting in the response and writing in the request. And I'm waiting for this to complete. And, and that's it. That's all the fuss around. It. So let's have a look. So the servers await us. And we have the bidirectional that hopefully will run. Now you're going to see things in, things out. Fingers crossed. OK. You see, now we are not ordered because my computer is very slow. Uh, in some demos, I have this super, super ordered. Uh, which is somehow confusing. So you'll see some sending things from zero to five. You'll see a received one, sending six, received one, sending seven, two, and so on. And at the end, you receive the re the rest of them. Uh, so in fact, my, my computer is slow. <laughs> it was better for the demo. Okay, so everything is there, but do not rely on the ordering of these because you cannot rely on this. These are asynchronous, OK? So this is how, how it goes. This is all the fuss around, around GRC. But uh, we need to think and talk about strengths of, of gRPC. In REST, because I'm comparing, with, comparing it with REST, some people are comparing it with uh, WCF, if you're familiar with. I worked with WCF a while ago. And I'm not missing that. But um, these types are not versus, it's not uh, REST versus RPC or gRPC. It's uh, what tool do I choose in order to have my uh, application be performant and, uh, and everything. So if we were to look at the REST APIs, REST is resource focused. It embraces every HTTP semantics, like verbs, uh, headers, um, media types, and all. Uh, it gives you loose coupling, or it should give you loose coupling. Uh, I mean, it should be uh, help you decouple the client from the server side. Uh, it's text-based, so it's very easy to read. When RPC or gRPC is very action-based, it's towards um, oriented towards pro um, developers. It's very programmatic. Uh, it embraces the semantics of programming. It has tighter, tighter coupling, even though you're not sharing Nugget packages. You're sharing that proto file, and well, the coupling is there. Uh, and it's binary based. If you were to look at a specific response from the gRPC service, you need some additional work to do. I didn't do it yet, uh, but it's binary. So, unless you know how to read binary by yourself, um, you need to do some additional work. So, right now, with every .NET course uh, API that needs to talk with a specific client, you will have a, a gRPC stub for the client. And the client can be anything. It can be a, a front-end app, uh, and you'll use different things for uh, RPC. You'll have a .NET app, Node.js, or whatever thing that can use Roto. When it comes to strengths, performance is one of them. If we were to compare a specific uh, response for the same response, in REST, we would have that number. And in gRPC, you'll, uh, we will see that it's 80.98% smaller, which is huge in terms of performance. And not only that, but it will allow us to have polyglot environments. We can have components in our distributed system that is written in Go or Rust or whatever exotic language that we might find suitable. And more than that, it's super lightweight. It's easy to use and work with. And it's perfect for point-to-point -point communication. If you know where you want to point and take data from or send data from, uh, send data to, it's super useful. Bear in mind, REST is used for both client-to-server communication and for, for things that are exposed over the internet, like public APIs. But if you're not into public APIs or your business domain doesn't, it's not fitted for that, so gRPC might be a very good fit because you know what's inside it. So contract-based is another cool thing about it. You specify what, and you also prove how, but the clients will know what to call because they will have access to that specific contract. Smaller payloads, HTTP though is, is cool and inherently different. 
and faster. And it supports different streaming types. And I think we have enough in terms of strengths. But we cannot talk about strengths without also talking about downsides. Um, if you were to look at the architectural perspective of it, it still has a temporal coupling. Unlike messaging that I'm also trying to promote, you will still need the system to be both up at the same time. Unlike messaging where you, if the one system is not up, you'll find those messages in a queue somewhere and you'll be able to process those. So now, if the server is down, your everything will be down. And another downside might be that you as developer, you might forget that there's a network involved because it's so programmatic-like and you might somehow over abuse over uh, on, on the calls. So bear in mind, there is still a network in there even though it looks like the code is local. And another downside is that it's not human readable. And because it's not human readable, you'll need better testing. And better testing will mean that you should focus on CI CD. If you were to distribute the proto files, then you need to find a reliable way of distributing those from source control, from continuous integration, from delivery. Um, it's up to you how you share those, but you need to make sure that the proto files that you share around are accessible from anywhere in your system, or at least from the, the specific systems that need to deal with those. In summary, it's great for microservice communication. Don't abuse REST, because REST might not be suitable for your case. Give gRPC a try. It might uh, prove worthy. It's suitable for polyglot environments and allow us to do that. And it has four methods that gives us a lot of power and some other tools in our tool belt. It decouples code. Uh, it removes us from the need of sharing Nugget packages. And those Nugget packages that I mentioned tend to, to become spaghetti code or a spaghetti of dependencies. So I think that the future of web APIs, uh, if those APIs are not meant to be public or exposed, uh, it's somewhere in between like, there will be no more hunting for documentation, no more swagger and, okay, how to do this, what are the parameters uh, to be sent and so on. It will be more intuitive using the IDE. And more, uh, more than that, there will be no more misinterpretation of say, HTTP status codes. Uh, for example, is it a bad request or uh, 422, like I cannot process the entity because there is a validation error. And of course, there will be no more data parse, parse error because once you implement the server, any other consu consumer will have access to what's on the server already implemented. So uh, there will be no cases like, hey, something disappeared from an API in the response and the client, the consumer, is not able to, uh, to process that. So uh, bear in mind that distributed systems, no matter how large or how small, are all about trade-offs. And being all about trade-offs, it means that we need to decide what are the right tools for us. So if something is good for me, it not, might not be good for you. So you need to choose wisely. As the next step, uh, maybe you'll have time and have a look at gRPC web, which will allow communication, for example, between browser and a gRPC app. Um, it's fairly new from last year. I think the end of the year. Uh, you can give this a try with Blazor. Why not? HTTP2 as uh, an implementation. If you're interested more in um, Proto and the syntax, you can have a look at uh, Google uh, documentation. And of course, if you're on, into using curl, there is a gRPC curl option that you can find on Git, GitHub uh, there. And another thing that I cannot uh, not recommended is gRPC for WCF developers, um, written by Mark Randall. It's very cool and it gives you a lot of insight uh, into gRPC, even if you didn't work with WCF before. But it also does a comparison if it's easier for you to understand it. You'll find there are a lot of things about authorization, authentication, and how to do uh, that, and more about gRPC types. 
that might be handy for you. So I think this is it from my side. Thank you for listening. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can DM me on Twitter if you you have any questions outside uh, outside this, this talk. And also you can find me on on my blog, Urina Codes. And fingers crossed, I also uh, I have in, in plan to to write something about gRPC. So thank you for being here. I think we can uh, take some questions. Yes. Uh, thank you, Irina, uh, for preparing the talk and for being with us. And we already have a couple of questions from the chat. And I guess we'll start from the first one. So uh, what about Swagger and, and Swag client? client? Um, we do not have something like this for gRPC. Uh, Swagger and NSWAG, and I really advise you to use NSWAG uh, to generate clients, uh, are not to be used with, with gRPC. So they're, it's still at the beginning, and we need to have uh, the community develop some tools. Okay, great. So the next question is, are there any other ways to share protofiles? Nothing crosses my mind except um, source control and using the CI CD system to, to make sure that the files are locating, located in the proper location on, uh, on the server. Thank you. And the next question is, uh, is there any option to create a channel over a stream or IDuplex pipe system IO pipelines? Um, GRPC is not related to uh, IDuplex pipe system IO pipelines. I didn't try that. Uh, the channel as a concept, it's out there uh, by default with uh, gRPC library. And it offers the duplex and full duplex um, comparison, uh, depending on the mode you're choosing. If it's bidirectional, it will be a uh, full duplex back and forth on the same, let's call it channel. Okay, so it's basically one HTTP connection opened and the server and the client can communicate with several pieces of data uh, on the same channel without opening a new TCP connection and so on. OK, great. Thank you. Um, uh, we don't have any more questions. At least no one uh, wrote it during your talk. Uh, so I guess uh, people can reach you uh, in your sure context. And uh, we can share the presentations as well. So you, people can see the links and can go to the links you recommend that. And also there are also your, um, your contacts. And I hope they can reach you and ask more questions if they have it. Thank sure you. Thing. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us. Have a nice evening. You too.